This is Paw Print, an animal rescue community. Episode 130. I'm Harold Ree, and today we have our amazing guest host, Melinda Lee. Hi, Harold. Today's guest is author Laura Shannon with the incredible book, The Dogs of Avalon, The Race to Save Animals in Peril. Melinda, we, we had a chance to receive advanced copies of Laura's wonderful book, The Dogs of Avalon. Any initial thoughts as, as you were reading her book? Really great storytelling, and it was very hard for me to put it down because you were following the life of one of the main characters named Marion. There are two key things that I actually, that I personally took away from reading this book. Um, one being not only having compassion for animals, but also having compassion for our community and the people that are out there either caring for the animals or the animals are going to them. And the second thing that I that really stood out to me was this need for managing ourselves as people in the uh, animal welfare advocacy environment. Compassion fatigue is a is a big concern. And obviously in the interview, we'll have Laura explain the, the background of the book, but essentially it does involve a character or, or a real person, Marion Fitzgibbon, who mm-hmm. through a long, like decades of her life, basically becomes this unbelievable animal rescue hero. And in particular, a good chunk of her life is dedicated to uh, saving greyhounds, which we, of course, have had previous episodes about greyhounds in the United States uh, related to dog racing and all that. But Ireland actually has probably maybe the most robust dog racing industry. I mean, it really is sort of part of the culture and almost uh, uh, in the blood in some ways. So many, there are so many traditions that I didn't know about. Traditions in terms of the sport of racing these great hounds and also outside of the racing environment, what the community, what their perception is of these dogs. Definitely, which a lot of the world has that, that dogs oh, are, yeah. that dogs have a job, dogs have a role. And Marion... Marion tries to put sort of a um, sort of a, a soul in these animals, and we try to do that in so many ways with all different breeds. It's it's interesting hearing about the plights of the greyhounds in Ireland. How did you feel feel about the way she kind of weaves together all these people and all these animals? It was really interesting because in starting with the first chapter, I was I was thrown a little because it wasn't really about greyhounds at all. It was actually about exotic animals that were being kept by a family. But it really made me that much more curious to continue reading the book because I knew that this book was about dogs, uh, about greyhounds. And her style of writing was knowing that it was a piece of history, documenting, documenting a piece of history. It was interesting to see it being woven together almost like a, a story. It read a lot like a novel, which... Sometimes when I get caught up in novels, I, I won't put it down. I don't know about you, but research books sometimes, if if it's plotting down points of history and facts, tend to be slower reads, just as interesting, but just a little slower. No, I agree. I thought, I thought Laura had a very beautiful writing style. Mm-hmm. And you're right. I mean, even when she was trying to go over some just basic raw numbers, uh, mm-hmm. she, she did try to weave it in a way that, that it wasn't just sort of a, a kind of a, a nerd fest or, or too scientific. I really felt like I was there. I was be there witnessing it with Marion. Every intimate moment that she had with each dog that she rescued, with the people that she was surrounding herself with and her family, you really felt the emotions of the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What else? I, I remember you, you said you were kind of struck by the, the this family, the McCarthy family, who are essentially... Uh, I guess, Ireland's version of a, of a wandering community or a traveler community is what they're called. So I've been doing a bit of reading about the Humane Society uh, of, of the United States' program called Pets for Life. Really interesting program. It's actually a take. It's not saying that the focus on getting do- homeless dogs adopted is not something that we should focus on. When I see that these dogs are entering the shelters and they're becoming homeless, I keep thinking, well, how do they wind up in these shelters in the first place? And this is what Pets for Life is actually addressing. Um, They're talking about how you can get to know your community and find out what it is they need so that the pets stay home rather than winding winding up in the shelters. When I was reading about the McCarthy family and how she 
how Marianne was finding that so many of the dogs were being, I guess, they were in need and they were sometimes coming from the care of the McCarthy family. They're gypsies. They're, they're moving around and the communities don't really want them lingering too long or staying on their land. It was interesting reading about how Marion actually got to know these people and realized how dire their needs were to live just on a day-to-day basis. And that really connected what Pets for Life is doing, To, in my opinion, is let's get to know what other people's needs are so that we can really get to the root of pet homelessness. Whenever people are impacted, whether it's by poverty Mm -hmm. Or in the case of the McCarthy family, some type of cultural bias, uh, Mm -hmm. it really has, it does truly have an impact on the animals too. So, so it's, it's that, it's that connection of, of empowering people, empowering animals. And she talks about this in her book, companion animals pretty much are humans creations. We, we gave them these jobs and they're, now after after years and year, generations of companion dogs they now depend on us we have our interview with author Laura Shinon and the dogs of Avalon thanks melinda thank you well it's a little bit of a, a story it was not on my usual path it was something actually that took me in a new direction i had written two books before that were related to food and cooking And I was pretty much known as a food writer. I'd written for magazines and, as I said, two books about food history. And I wrote a memoir through food. So, you know, I never would have thought I was going to write an animal book. But a friend of mine, I met a woman and she was, she had a greyhound. And she started to tell me about this greyhound and she brought him from Ireland. This is Elizabeth. I have to give her a really complete credit for writing the book. Elizabeth is someone who lives near me. I kind of met her, you know, I was actually selling something on, I was selling something online like Craigslist and she came to the house to buy it and we started chatting and became friends. And she's an Irish American who spent a lot of time in Ireland. And she started telling me about greyhounds and she was bringing over greyhounds and that they had problems over there. And then she started talking about this dog called Lurchers, which were a greyhound mix. And it all sounded very strange to me, and I was not interested. Why would you bring over dogs from Ireland to the United States when we have so many here uh, that need homes? And I thought it was really bizarre, and I just kind of ignored it. But around the same time, my son, who was about you know, maybe eight, nine years old, and then finally 10 years old, had been asking for a dog incessantly. And I really didn't want to do it. But he was at a time in his life when he uh, really needed a dog, I felt. And so I, when Elizabeth sent around an email of this beautiful, gorgeous dog that had had a terrible time, it was sort of like the before and after pictures She had been found on a road in Ireland, just a total mess. And these women in a sanctuary had taken her in and, and she was beautiful, just so beautiful. And there was a story with it that said she was a miracle dog. And I thought, okay, that's our dog. And then once we, we got her, I was very interested in her story because I fell in love with her and the question of why were these dogs being shipped from Ireland And uh, who were these women who were saving them? What were they doing? So I was curious. That's that's how it started about my dog. Yeah, wonderful. You want to tell us a little bit about your own dog, who you actually do write about in the book? Yes. (laughs) Like, I guess all people who who have dogs as family members, I, I love her. In some ways, she's the most beloved of the family. Her name is Lily, and she... She looks like a small version of a greyhound. She looks exactly like a greyhound, but smaller. She's about 45 pounds, 40 pounds. And a, this, you know, greyhounds tend to be from 50, 55 to even 75. So she's a small version. She kind of looks like a whippet crossed with a greyhound. And she was probably a dog, almost certainly in Ireland, that was owned by the travelers. That's the itinerant group of people there who have really uh, raised and cultivated these dogs for a very long time. She's essentially a cast off of the Irish greyhound racing industry. Okay. What makes Lily special? I think it's that greyhound quality. 
in her, she, she really is so greyhound. She's extremely sweet and she's been through so much. I have the photos and they're on my website where you can see the letter that I originally saw where she was covered in mange, terrible case. Her, her fur was off, her skin was bloody and she just had been through so much. And yet her personality is just so sweet. But of course, the thing that makes her special is that, you know, when I, I didn't know what to make of her when she came, but when we took her and I saw her run, that was the moment where I thought, oh my God, this is extraordinary. Just the beauty of it, the poetry in motion of watching a greyhound run. (laughs) Amazing. We've actually featured some other greyhound owners in previous episodes. And the theme that I tend to get is that greyhounds do tend to have somewhat like a sixth sense, right? We read so much into our animals. We put so much into them, on them. So many emotions. We expect them to do so much emotional work for us. But so that (laughs) said, yes, it does seem like there's a certain something. She's, you know, they have personalities more like cats, as you may have heard. She's really kind of a perfect dog for, for us because we're both working. We had young kids and I didn't have a lot of time. And Lily just doesn't ask for a lot. She just likes to be near you. So many different subjects and topics. Uh, Is there any way you can kind of wrap it up in like 15 to 20 seconds what the book is about? Oh, absolutely. That's fine. Yeah, there's two main storylines. One is that um, after I had this dog and I was curious about how she'd come to the United States, I met a woman um, who was really responsible for her. Her name was Marion Fitzgibbon. And she had been for 30 years by then uh, taking care of street animals in Ireland and she had become a, a champion for the um, the greyhounds and many other things. She, When I met her, she told me about all the stuff that she had done from feeding animals on the street at night to taking them in and building this network of foster homes there. She became the head of the ISPCA. She took on the greyhound business. But she said to me, every living being has... Um, the right to live and die with dignity. And I was so affected by that that I followed her story. So the, the story is in the book of Marion Fitzgibbon and her, her rise uh, to become uh, head of the ISPCA, some of the underground crazy missions that she took to, to fight the industry, and then her finally her dream of building an amazing sanctuary. So the story follows her life but through it, there's also me. I'm a secondary character, and I guess you could say it's my conversion runs along as I slowly become aware. of some, I was someone who really hadn't seen animals before. My son was an animal person, but I didn't really get it. And so the book kind of takes my, um, my awakening as a second storyline. Yeah. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that in, in the sense that animal rescue, right, is it's a lot about once you see something, it's so difficult to unsee it. Uh, was there anything that you saw or that you heard that made that that lasting impression on you? Well, there were a lot of things, um, but two, two stories come to mind. Once I got into it, I had this recollection about my son, the animal guy, that when, when I had taken him once, we hadn't planned it, but someone took us. We found ourselves at a SeaWorld type place in uh, Florida. And when my son saw the, the dolphins, you know, swimming and leaping in this, you know, this small environment, he just screamed and cried and said, I'm not going in there. They're in prison. I, I hadn't understood it at the time. I mean, I thought, oh, that's wonderful, but I was kind of annoyed by it. It was, it was an inconvenience. But then once I got Lily and met Marion, I reflected back like, wow, he was really right. So that really will always stay with me. And then the other thing was I went to a sanctuary, a farm animal sanctuary with my son, Simon, my second son. And we, um, we got close to a pig named Olive (laughs) and I held a chicken and I met people there. You know, they're all kind of crazy, I think, but I got it and it did change me uh, forever. So those things, there were many experiences, you know, once when I was in Ireland and I went to go talk to some dog men. I did want to give their side to the story, and I, I met some that I actually liked quite a lot. I wound up by accident going on a, being taken on an adventure to go and see where a guy kept his dogs on a farm, and it so happened to be a pig farm, which I couldn't have fathomed. And this lovely man, pig farmer, comes out so genial and chats me up, and I'm kind of getting horrified what's going on, and he's saying, do you want to hold a pig, a baby pig? And he takes me into this farrowing, I don't know, it was like a warehouse and all these pigs were 
were there and babies. And I just, he held one up to me and that was just a horrifying moment for me. And that did change me also. If you're walking into uh, a pig warehouse, I mean, obviously I would imagine that the smell might be overwhelming, but any other sort of sensations that you felt as, as you were entering? Uh, I started to have a panic attack. Um, the uh, smell was unbelievable. It's not just manure, it's something else. I, I was really having a panic attack that I had to hold it together. I was being a reporter and, you know, act cool and calm. I think just the sight of all of these animals in these uh, crates, these small spaces with babies, just the birthing factory of it, it was the sight the grimness, the light was low. There was, there was, it was just all of these beings, just like hundreds of them. It seemed like maybe it was a hundred, maybe it was 200. I, I did. I was having a panic attack. Mm. So some parts of me were shutting down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so yeah, so sorry to make you uh, have to recap that. No, it's okay. It's um, okay. You know, shifting over to then the, the whole greyhound, greyhound racing industry. I mean, you really go pretty in depth into the history, I mean, going you know back many, many, many years. Can you maybe describe to folks Ireland and their particular history with greyhound racing? You know, when I met someone early on in this, uh, this journey, she said to me, oh, well, Ireland is the home of the greyhound. It wasn't only Ireland. It was also, it was basically the, you know, Britain as well. But those islands there, the British Isles, where the Celts came, they had traveled across Europe. We don't have a lot of details about it, but we know that, that the Celts were moving through and arrived in Ireland a couple of thousand years ago, and they brought these dogs with them. And they also went to Great Britain. The thing is about Ireland is that you can't separate the issue of colonialism ever from Irish history. It's just always there. And the poverty that that Ireland experienced as a result. So um, these dogs had been there mostly as hunting dogs. Greyhound racing didn't begin in Ireland. The first greyhound race on an oval track that we know of was in 1919 in the United States, not far from where you are right now in that's the right. Bay Area. In, in Emeryville, uh, California. Emeryville, right. California. That's right. And it, a man had seen the, um, the sport of coursing. Owen Patrick Smith had seen the sport and saw a rabbit torn to pieces by a couple of greyhounds and thought this, he, he was an engineer and he wanted to solve the problem by making a mechanical lure. He really is the grandfather of, of greyhound racing. It's a fairly well-known story. But the interesting thing is the way it took off in the early 20th century in many places all at once. So, you know, in the early 20s, it, you had racing just start to spread from uh, the United States to Britain to Ireland, you know, not long after Australia. The special thing about Ireland is that it was an agricultural country, a great history of breeding horses, and breeding greyhounds just really fit in. And the Irish excelled at it. And the British came across the water to buy their greyhounds from the Irish. So it was something that they did well. At a certain point, the government noticed this that it was a great econ you know great piece of their economy they thought it was money it was jobs and so they started to subsidize it and they subsidized it like no other country in the world there's no place else in the world that gives so much money to the business and that's what always was driving Marion Fitzgibbon uh, you know the main character of this story it was driving her crazy that the government would spend this money so w when you're dealing with a government sponsored industry, they were just, the, the business was very protected. Although the Greyhound adoption movement started in the United States in the 80s and in the, actually in the UK way earlier, and in many places, it really hadn't come to Ireland. If you think about a country that didn't even become an independent country till early in the 20th century, there were other priorities and there was so much poverty that animal welfare was not really one of them. The other issue that's really critical is that the Irish do not see greyhounds as suitable pets. And really, no one did anywhere in the Western world or in Australia, you, you know, think that racing dogs made pets. So this is the story that is kind of well known, that thousands of them were just discarded, disposed of. They call it euthanized. But some a movement started, led mostly by women, to divert them into adoption. 
But that was really late in coming to Ireland, and that's what Marion Fitzgibbon tried to do. In talking with Marion, how many months, how many years did you did you speak to her about about uh, or, or you know as you were gathering the notes? How long did it take you? I think if she ever had any idea how much time I would take from her, she never would have said yes. Oh, I don't know. She's a wonderful person. She has a son. From who lives not far from me, just coincidentally. So the first time I met her was 2007. She was coming to visit him, and I had that first conversation. I didn't decide to do the book until 2008, so I went there and I spent time with her. I Then it was a lot of phone calls, another couple of visits when she was in New Jersey, emails, and I was constantly asking her questions and details about her, her life story. Um, and then I made a trip in 2011 and then another in 2013. You know, she gave me hundreds of hours, I would have to say. She committed literally decades of her life. She sacrificed so much time with family, with friends. Ultimately, why do you think she does what she does? Well, that was the mystery in the first place. And, you know, I asked her that and she just said, I, I was born that way. That became a refrain with many, I don't know, when you speak with animal rescue people, do you hear the same thing? They say, I was born that way. I don't know. I just was that way since I was a child. I loved animals. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Although, although I don't know if any, any of them have the track record of Marion Fitzgibbon. No, no. There's a, a great scene where she's four years old in the car and there's a horse pulling a, you know, there weren't many cars. She was born in 1940. There weren't many cars in Ireland, but her father had one. And um, she saw um, a horse in the pouring rain pulling a big burden, a big cart. And she just knew the horse was suffering in the rain. And she just started screaming, you know, I want to give the horse an umbrella. I want to give the horse an umbrella. She was just driving her crazy. And she sobbed and sobbed and her parents just didn't get it at all. But she always remembers that moment of seeing the horse in the rain and tells me, I was born that way. She admits that there's a selfish part of it, an addiction almost to it. You think you're going to save the next and the next and the next. She does not glorify herself. I, you know, I said to her, how was this for your children? And she said, I don't know. You better ask them. She said, bad. I handled it badly. It was not good. So she, and she didn't understand what I saw in her story. <laughs> um, so that part. That was that was pretty interesting. What has changed for the state of greyhounds in Ireland, as far as you can tell? There have been things that have changed because of the declining demand in uh, in Britain. You know, there was a time when Ireland was exporting ten thousand greyhounds a year. Now it's like maybe half of that because of the growing awareness, because of the work that so many of these women did. Um, there has been a declining. Uh, demand for them. So, and then the economy also, you know, when it tanked in the recession, people were not going out and betting at these tracks. The tracks in Ireland are amazing. When you go to them in the United States or in Britain, they're kind of crumbling and old school, but there's so much money put into them. So fewer people came and fewer people bet. And so it really went, really the money, it shrank tremendously. So there were fewer dogs being born. So that's just market forces that helped. But the government is really set on building it up again. I will say that there has been um, there have been a real growing number of inquiries and interest in abuses and mismanagement of this government agency that manages, you know, Greyhound Racing. It's a semi-government body. So there's a lot more people looking at it now. And little by little, people are looking at greyhounds in Ireland and lurchers, but still they have to get exported out to find homes. Right. And of course, um, it's not even just uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland, but it even dogs end up in Spain, which is probably some of the most traumatic uh, parts of your book at these kind of low, lower level greyhound uh, races. Right. When dogs can't race and they can't earn money, they'd get sold and uh, at these auctions. And those ha they still happen all the time. Uh, and this is back in the 90s. The, this is when Marion first kind of had her awakening that she had to do something about the greyhounds. She would see these agents coming from Spain and take these dogs. And they knew, she knew. There were, there were just too many reports coming back. And there were other women. I, I was not only Marion. She'd be the first person to tell you. There was a woman named Anne, Sh Anne Shannon uh, who was very early upset about the greyhound situation going to Spain getting shipped out there, having these terrible, like, you know, 
14 hour journeys across sea and and, uh, these terrible trucks and not getting water. And so there were other people writing to many governments, but not getting anywhere. Uh, There was an amazing woman named Anne Finch in Britain. She was a nurse. She also um, became crazed over the situation of, of these greyhounds in Spain. So it's really important to say that there was a network. These people all knew one another. They worked together. But um, Marion just really said, these are Irish dogs, and we have to do something about it. We're the ISPCA. So she got money, and uh, not money, a little money for an undercover investigation, and she built a team that went and got evidence that, you know, the um, the Irish racing agency had been in denial about how awful it was, but she had an undercover agent with a video camera and a, and a vet who issued a report. And then the trading did stop. She made a difference there. But now that Ireland has lost um, its biggest customer in Britain, they are, you know, they have to look elsewhere in the world. If they want to have a a big export business, they're going to have to look at other places. And there's been a big concerns that they're going to, you know, sell dogs in Asia, send Irish greyhounds in, in to Asia where you know, animal rights are not where they are here. Well, your book is uh, is a big help in in really making people more aware of at least globally what's what's happening. So, thank you for for, for writing this book. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah. It was a great experience. Yeah. Well, we're talking to Laura Shannon. She's the author of The Dogs of Avalon. She's also previously published The Lost Ravioli Recipes of Hoboken. Uh, I wish I had a food podcast. I'd love to talk to you about that one. Uh, and then also uh, A Thousand Years Over a Hot Stove. Uh, as you were writing The Dogs of Avalon, did you kind of feel like you had any sort of themes that could sort of intersect with your two previous works? Oh, that's interesting. Well, certainly I was interested in in history and culture of food. And in fact, I said that to Marion once. I said, well, I wrote about food, but not not only recipes. I really love the culture of food. And she said to me, culture is everything. And that she understood that because of the rural values of, you know, animals. Uh, and, you know, we're really having a change in the world. I'd say that was a big, a big uh, theme in the book from rural economies as the whole planet becomes more urban. And this is not to say that rural people did not treat their animals well. That's not it at all. But just there's a different historic mentality about a dog being a source. I'm sorry, animals being a source of income. And if they can't produce, you have to get rid of them. But the world is changing. So so that was one theme, the culture, the old values of food. That was something I was interested in. Um, I think another thing is that when you think about animals, you really find yourself, if you're thinking in a big way, you're thinking about wild animals as well. You're thinking about all animals as humans, as animals. And you think about the planet. It leads you pretty, I mean, I found that it led me when I really started to think about that dolphin that my son was screaming about. There's a great story in the book where Marion gets involved in rescuing some tigers, a circus tigers that are uh, being kept in a backyard and, and a bear and baboons. Uh, how we perceive all animals has to do with where we see our place in the world compared to them. And, you know, historically in the Western world, we've thought that we are superior to all animals. So I think the concern for, you know, once we start to see them as beings that we're sharing our planet with, we'd start to think about climate and land and habitat and all of those things are connected to the natural world as is food. Thanks for sharing that. I I was... really touched by uh, the lyricism, the the beauty of your writing. And it was really written almost a, in the way a novel, maybe a, a more fictional novel would be written. Was that intentional? Did you, were you trying to sort of make what, what can be kind of a, a pretty dark topic, which is animal rescue, uh, into something that, that could be seen maybe with a little touch of, of beauty and passion? Well, I can't thank you enough for saying that. That is almost the best thing any reader could say to me because that was the thing I wanted to do the most. I love literature and I I was trying to, I'm one of these people who really believes, I really want to write nonfiction to read as a novel. It was very, very hard because you can't make things up and I was set on the truth. But yes, I wanted it to be like a novel. I used the tricks of a novelist, you know, the techniques. Certainly there are dark times, but there were some um, couple of very funny moments in the book that helped take the brunt of that and using my dog for some relief and some silliness, you know, that happens with suburban people and their dogs to kind of create some comic relief to take away from that 
difficulty, uh, but certainly the beauty and the passion of people, you know, doing their best with this short time of that we have on earth and devoting their lives to, to the most voiceless beings on the planet. Those are great literary themes. And Marion really follows a, in the book, follows a whole hero's quest. You know, she has a call to action. She goes out, she does things in the world, and then she has to re- return home. And her final wish is to complete this sanctuary at home. It's a very, these are very kind of archetypal themes, you know. But they're there for a reason. They're there in literature and they're there in real life for a reason because they exist. The one person I want to ask about, Beverly Wolf, is really a pretty important person during the course of this book. Could you maybe talk uh, a little bit about Beverly Wolf? So Marion is struggling. You know, they have no money in Ireland. She's trying to build this network of dogs. And, um, well, I could even tell it from another point of view, which was Beverly's point of view. She's an American who had sort of a normal life um, with his children. And um, she had horse, she was interested in horses, but not in a big wealthy way. She sent her daughter for riding lessons and she got interested. And while she was interested in this, she met uh, a man who she fell in love with and eventually went with him. And he was a very wealthy man who was a fox hunter. Now, um, Beverly was one of these people born with that gene, that animal rescue gene, that animal gene. She loved horses, loved dogs, any creature. She was an amazing animal, hands-on animal person, healing, caring for. But her husband, Simon, was uh, a a major fox hunter. And the greatest uh, fox hunting is in Ireland. And that became his dream to go there and live there. And finally, they went and he bought this huge estate. And it really was in some ways a very fairy tale life for Beverly to be involved with these hunts that went back 300 years. There's full of pageantry and people coming from all over the world to hunt in Ireland. And she had this amazing estate with many rooms and many outbuildings and many, a lot of space. And one day when she was in the city, she picked up a a dog. She was in Limerick and she picked up a, a sick dog and took him home. Actually, she took him to the vet. And uh, the vet called Marion and said, you know, there was an American in here today and she's as daft as you are. She picked a dog up <laughs> off the street and brought her in here, picking, you know, paying good money to, to make a street dog better. So Marion called uh, Beverly Wolf, got her number and said, I'm with, you know, Limerick Animal Welfare and we're doing work. Would you like to join us? And this became uh, a lifelong friendship of soul sisters, really. Beverly offered her whole house and her, not her whole house, but all these grounds. And she became, for 20 years, she and Marion worked together side by side. Beverly provided the space for for Marion's organization, Limerick Animal Welfare. And the interesting thing there is all the contradictions of a fox hunter's wife and all these fox people and being on the fox hunter's ground, his facilities to house all these dogs. But Beverly was the one person who was as crazy as Marion. If Marion called her at three in the morning and said, there's a horse that needs to get picked up, Beverly would say, okay, I'll get my trailer and come. Yeah, I think in some ways, Beverly was even in some ways crazier than Marion. I think even Marion was surprised sometimes. Yes, yes. She brought out, they brought out a wild, they brought out, there's a little bit of a badass thing that happened with the two of them together where they were changing the world. And that's the way they saw it. And they fired up one another. But yes, Beverly was uh, a real powerful, uh, had a lot of personal power as a human being. She followed love. You know, she left her family. Uh, She followed love. She followed her passion. She's a very rich, full human being. But there was that contradiction there. And it is a thing, you know, there are hunting people who were always very involved in animal welfare because they saw hunting as something separate. You know, one of the things I tried to get across in the book, I'm not an advocate, I'm a writer, and and life is complicated. And, you know, we all uh, are interconnected in some surprising ways. The animal issue, as you much know, must know, crosses uh, many, many lines. It draws people together who might be very different and have nothing else in common. The wonderful thing about animal rescue is that, that it's what joins us together. For better or for worse, though, a lot of us have so many different backgrounds and so many other ways that we interact with animals that might be conceived of as, as contradictory, but, but it is what life is, right? That's life. Mixed bag. Yeah. I, I, you know, <laughs> I've started to, I started to wonder with all of the division that we have uh, right now in our society between left and right and blue and red, I, I have found that, you know, animals does, you know, they're, 
it does bring a, a large piece of compassion from, from all sides. It, it so sure that makes is. it interesting. Yeah, it sure does. Speaking of animal rescue, all the different dynamics, any advice now that you've seen it happen and you've spoken to some real legends, any advice that you might give to animal rescue groups today? You know, I am not the person to do that, but uh, and on the tactical matter, but I have one thing that I did learn um, that comes out in the book, and that is the beginning starts with, with this rescue of circus animals who are being kept in bad condition in a farmer's backyard. He had some crazy idea. We take them from the service circus and create a menagerie for his daughter. So obviously there are problems with that. And by the time Marion gets to see them, it's just horrible. And these animals are in terrible condition. But when I talked, and then there becomes this amazing rescue effort, you know, to get them out. But when I talked to the people involved, particularly this wonderful Irishman, Brendan Price, who was very helpful to Marion in this, and, and the veterinarian who came to help, they said, you know, it always starts out that it's, this is not a bad person. He was so loved animals so much that he wanted to save these 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 creatures. He they, he was told that they would be killed if he didn't take them. What they told me is what where things go wrong is when people love animals so much that they take in more than they can handle. And I think that sense of the the you know the un, it's so unbearable to see animals suffering. Yes, I have to take in more, but it has to be kept um, to a level where you can manage it. Otherwise, that's when things when you have problems. Another thought is that what makes Marion, and maybe Beverly to a certain degree, but, but Marion especially, what makes her so amazing is that she doesn't just, uh, I don't know, collapse and die from all the work. I mean, she literally does this for decades upon decades where most of us, I think, would either quit or burn out. Any thoughts on how Marion was able to really do this? Without, without any sort of noticeable permanent burnout or any symptoms of permanent burnout? So uh, two things. Beverly was done, you know, at a certain point. When she came back to the United States after about 20 years in Limerick, she was done. And I visited her in South Carolina where she lives now. And she just was, she was burnt out and she couldn't take it anymore. But, and I, it, you know, that was, that was very clear. Marion suffers, I would say, from constant, um, trauma, emotional trauma. And I don't know how she does it. I truly don't know. <laughs> I think that was why I was so fascinated by her. I think that she's just, there are certain people who are special individuals who have this drive, but it's not like she's got Teflon in her. She, I don't know how she does it. That's such a good question. I know. And she I guess, suffers. Right. <laughs> and, and I guess she would not be the best person to ask about how to how to get through it. It is really something. That's a very good question. You know, anybody in animal rescue will burn out. It's not a matter of if, it's usually a matter of when. And right. um, you know, it, Actually, and, you, and you can be a volunteer and and burn out. You, you don't have to be paid staff. So I think what's very important there is she was the person who was not so much with the hands-on work. She was the person. She does that too. And she has to raise money all the time for her shelter. As everyone knows, that's the other thing that can burn you out. But she, had to do, she has to do that. But she also acted as an advocate. And she decided, you know, Beverly would say, stay here. I need you here at the shelter helping with dogs. But Marion would be going to the ISPCA meetings in Dublin to try to change the system. And later on, she would have a lot of doubts about whether or not that was the right use of her time. But I think maybe a little less wear and tear from being the person like Beverly, who is like, you know, these dogs come in, they're, they're sick, you're dealing with all kinds of bodies. And uh, that's a different kind of thing. Marion did some of that for sure. She used to always have like 10 dogs in her house that she was doing that for, but it's slightly different. We're speaking to Laura Shannon, author of The Dogs of Avalon. Uh, Laura, what's the best way to, to find you, whether it's a website or social media? I have an author Facebook page and my website is up. It's laurashanone.com. And if you just Google Dogs of Avalon and Laura, I'm sure you'll find me. You're going to be going on a short book tour to, uh, to support your book, right? That's right. I'll be out and about. Launch date is Tuesday, August 22nd. Uh, w. w. Norton is the publisher. Uh, what, was, what was the process of writing the book? But by the time you took all your notes... How long did it actually take you to to complete? <laughs> uh, the book came at a time in my life where I had a full-time job. 
So it took me a very long time. It took me seven years. I did it on the side and I had two kids, two kids at home. I guess Gabriel was in his teens and Simon was, I mean, it went on for seven years. So it went through a lot of their childhoods. So that's how long it took. But there were many stops and starts. And again, I had a full-time job. So um, I did it on the side. When you think about Lily and you think about the journey before she met you and and maybe maybe the journey of, of some of her, her siblings, what do you think she would make of you writing a book about the Greyhounds of Ireland? Well, she's right here by me, and she's asleep on a big, cushy bed. And uh, <laughs> I look at her all the time and wonder. I, I honestly wonder. Um, I don't think she'd let the publicity get to her head. I think <laughs> that, now, honestly, I sometimes do wonder you know how all you want to do is ask your dog questions and you can't. I do wonder if she would have been had a happier life living in a wild place where she could ch- chase rabbits. You know, we live near the city. I, I don't know what she would think. I asked her a lot, but she didn't tell me. Well, with that said, just want to give you the floor. Anything that, that we haven't discussed that you'd like to share? Oh, wow. I just think that the great thing that's going on in the world is that we are learning to see animals more. Animals are so unseen, and I didn't see them myself until I adopted Lily and went on this journey. So I think that's a very positive thing. And then the other thing is to take inspiration from the fact that here are some people who rolled up their sleeves and just got to work and made a difference. And I think it's a great thing, and obviously that's what your show is all about. We want to say thank you to Laura Shannon and her book, The Dogs of Avalon. Launch date is Tuesday, August 22nd, at your favorite bookstore. We also want to say thank you to Melinda Lee for being such a wonderful co-host. And thanks to Will Scarlett of W.W. Norton for arranging our interview with Laura. If you want to learn more about Laura Shannon, go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 130. That's the number 130. All the music you hear on Pawprint is produced, composed, and performed by Luke Gartner Brereton. You can find him at info.vanillagroovemedia.com. If you want to listen to more episodes of Pawprint, you can find us on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or Podcast Addict. Search for Pawprint Animal Rescue and hit the subscribe button to get the latest episodes immediately. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Look for our handle, This Is Paw Print, all one word. We just want to say thank you to all of you for sharing Paw Print with your friends and family. We're already at 130 episodes, and we could not have done it without your support. So a big hug from all of us. And remember, you spread a positive message of love and peace by saving an animal. Have a great day, everyone, and see you next time on Paw Print. is a production of EVER Education. You can't handle the truth.